All right, here's what we're doing today. We're going to go over one of the most famous proofs in the world that the square root of 2 is irrational. And then we're going to see where this proof fails when we try to prove that some other number will do the square root of 4, when we try to prove that that's irrational. And that will just help clarify the proof and the crux of the proof when we see how it fails uh, to prove that something's irrational when, in fact, it isn't. But we're going to start by going over the original proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. And uh, I'll explain all the details here, so if you're not even sure what irrational means, maybe you've never even done a proof, uh, everything here I'll try to make as accessible as possible. Quickly, uh, I guess we should start with irrational, right? What the heck does this mean? So for a number to be irrational means that it can't be expressed as a ratio of two integers. A lot of words there, right? Uh, so let's just make sure we know what integers are. Those are just, uh, we could say, your whole numbers, positives, negatives, and zero. So we've got numbers like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, etc. Integers are the numbers with no fractional part. So all your negatives, your positives, zero, just no uh, fractions, no decimals in there, right? Those are the integers. So for a number to be irrational means that it can't be expressed as a ratio of two integers. So for example, um, of numbers that are rational, four, four is rational because you could write four, for example, as four over one. These representations aren't unique. We could also express four as eight over two. Clearly, we can write four as a ratio of two integers, so it's a rational number. Another rational number is one half, because you can write it as a ratio of two integers. It is also equal to five tenths, for example. Lots of ways you could express it as a ratio of two integers. Another example of a rational number is 0.142857 repeating. This repeating decimal can be written as 1 over 7. So indeed, it's a rational number. Now, what are some irrational numbers? Well, as we'll see today, root 2 is one of them, and among the most famous. Uh, certainly the most famous irrational number, perhaps you know, is pi. A lot of different ways you could write pi. I've been writing it that way lately. Another famous one is e. And of course, the one we're focused on today is the square root of 2. You don't really have to know what any of these are right now. But as for the square root of 2, uh, it's about 1.41. And it's far from a number that's like, you know, totally made up and would like never occur in reality. Uh, you know, it's an important, significant number. All you have to do is consider a square whose sides all have a length of one. We call this the unit square. So every side has a length of one. And how long do you think the diagonal of that square is? How long's the diagonal? Well, if you know the Pythagorean theorem, you could quickly show that the diagonal has a length of a square root of two. So, I mean, hey, it's an important number and a number that shows up in a situation that simple, the diagonal of a square, has this great big complexity that you can't write it as a ratio of two integers. Now I said it's about 1.41, right? But what this also means for it to be irrational, uh, what that says about its decimal expansion, you know, we could continue this and get more and more accuracy if we wanted, but like pi, if you've learned about pi and irrational numbers before, there's no way to write the square root of two exactly as a decimal expansion. Its decimal expansion is non-terminating and non-repeating. So anyway, that's just a little intro to what root two is, right? Shows up as the diagonal of a unit square. Um, that's what an irrational number is. And now we're gonna go ahead and prove that the square root of two is irrational. Oh, and as for the title of the video, you know, um, why is this a deadly proof? Well, as, as the legend goes, the Pythagoreans, which was Pythagoras's uh, cult or brotherhood of mathematicians back in the day, um, they, they really believed strongly that these, these natural numbers could describe the entire world, right? Just integers. You could just use integers and ratios of integers, and you can describe the whole world. And uh, so legend has it that one of the Pythagoreans named Hippasus, I'll put his name down, uh, legend has it that Hippasus proved, in fact, that, oh no, oh no, not all numbers can actually be expressed as a ratio of integers. In fact, something as simple as root two, the diagonal length of a square, um, 
cannot be expressed in this way. And uh, as the legend goes, he was drowned, thrown overboard. Um, sometimes it's thought perhaps he uh, just happened to drown after proving that Root 2 is irrational. And the Pythagoreans thought, you know, it served him right. Um, anyhow, in all likelihood, that story is probably not true. The historical fact to uh, account for it is rather scant. Uh, but it is a fun legend that the Pythagoreans took the square root of 2, um, or, or I should say the ability of the natural numbers to describe the world. They took that so seriously that when Hapasis said, oh no, you know, we got a number that just can't be described as a ratio of integers, um, that was a lethal problem. So let's revisit this legendary proof. All right, so should be able to fit the proof over here, no problem. Uh, the idea behind this proof, it's going to be a proof by contradiction. So what that means is we're going to assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. And we're going to show that forces something that's impossible. It forces a contradiction. Hence, that assumption that we made, the opposite of what we want to prove, that assumption has to be false. So let's see it in action. I'm going to write, I'll just write it out. So we, we start these proofs like this. Suppose for contradiction. This means that we're making this assumption directly against the conclusion that we're trying to achieve. And once we make this um, assumption, we're going to demonstrate that it forces an impossibility. So suppose for contradiction that the square root of 2 is rational. The square root of 2 is rational. Again, we're going to prove that it's irrational. All right. And so we're going to show that it being rational forces an impossibility. Maybe we can write the rest in orange, okay. So what does it mean if root two is rational? You know, a lot of times how we do these proofs, uh, you got to apply definitions, right? That's your basic starting point. If the square root of two is rational, that means the square root of two, this is just by definition, must equal a over b, where a and b are integers. It, it must be possible to write the square root of two this way if it's rational. Now let's just specify, you know, what A and B have to be. Like I said, A and B are integers. One way we can write that is like this. A and B are elements of the integers. A lot of fancy symbols there. This little guy that looks like a small E almost, that means is an element of or belongs to. And this Z, this Z character, um, is for the integers. So this means that A and B are in the set of integers. The reason it's Z, if I recall correctly, derives from a uh, German word. I don't remember the details, though. Anyhow, this is what it means. Square root of 2 is equal to A over B. It has to for uh, square root of 2 to be rational. Oh, there's also the restriction that B uh, can't be 0, right? So dividing by zero, that's not a thing. So square root of two, it's gotta be A over B. B is not zero, A and B are integers. This is what it means for root two to be rational. All right, let's start working with this. If the square root of two equals A over B, we could square both sides. And then on the left, we would have two because squaring the square root, those cancel out. And on the right, we would have A squared divided by B squared. And then we could multiply both sides by B squared and we would get that 2b squared is equal to a squared. Oh, and before we go any further, I forgot one other thing. Um, a over b, we're going to make one more assumption about this, okay? A over b, we're going to assume that this is in lowest terms, right? You know how you can reduce fractions sometimes? We're going to assume this is fully reduced, okay? Because if we can write the square root of 2 as a fraction like this, well, certainly we can write it as a fully reduced fraction, right? If I say, hey, the square root of 2 is equal to a over b, um, if that's in lowest terms already, great. If it's not in lowest terms already, let's say that we fully reduced it, okay? So that now it is in lowest terms. For it to be in lowest terms means that a and b have no common factor. And that's, a, that's the key detail of this proof. That's where we're going to get our contradiction. So just to make sure we're totally on the same page, if I have the fraction a over four, uh, these guys have a factor in common, right? They have the factor of four in common. And so we can reduce it to two over one, or of course, just two. Okay, so let's assume that we've done all that reduction for a over b. So they can't have any common factors, like something like 3 sevenths. 3 and 7 have no common factors. This fraction is fully reduced, so we're assuming it's like that. a and b have no common factors. Okay, coming back to where we were, 2b squared equals a squared. 
If 2b squared equals a squared, this means that a squared is a multiple of 2, right? Because 2 times something equals a squared. So a squared is a multiple of 2, and we could write this. 2 divides a squared. This vertical line here means divides. Another way to read this is just that 2 goes into a squared, or a squared is a multiple of 2. And again, that's because we see that in this equation. 2 multiplied by b squared equals a squared. Hence, 2 divides a squared. 2 goes into a squared. A squared is a multiple of 2. But this also means that a is even, right? So this means that a squared is even, because 2 divides a squared, so a squared must be even. But that also forces a to be even. We can also say that 2 must divide a, because if we square an odd number, like 3 squared, 5 squared, 9 squared, all of those numbers are odd. If you square an odd number, you get an odd number. The only way the square could be even, the only way the square could be a multiple of 2, is if the number we're squaring, which in this case is a, is if that's already even. It's already a multiple of 2. So a has to be a multiple of 2. Now if a is a multiple of 2, then of course we could write that a is equal to 2 times k, for example. Right? a has to equal 2 times something, because a is a multiple of 2. To be a little more formal, we can say that a equals 2 times k, where k is an element of the integers. So k is 2 times some integer, because we know that a is a multiple of 2. Then we could come back to this equation, 2b squared equals a squared, and we could write that 2b squared equals 2k squared. Because on this right side, we have a squared, but a we know is 2k. So we could write this as 2k squared. Now, I'm sorry, I probably should have written this down here. Let me rewrite it down here where we have a little bit more room to work with. 2b squared equals 2k squared. Now, if we actually do this squaring on the right side, we're going to have that 2b squared equals 2 squared, which is 4, and k squared. And then we can divide both sides of this equation by 2 to get that b squared equals 2k squared. So again, just dividing both sides by 2 there. So now this, this is like we're right back in this situation. Here we have that b squared is equal to 2 times something. This means that 2 must divide b squared. b squared has to be a multiple of 2. I can write over here that b squared... Uh, let me write this, 2 divides b squared. So just like up here, right, b squared must be a multiple of 2. That's what this equation says. b squared equals 2 times some stuff. So b squared is a multiple of 2. And as before, this means that b must be a multiple of 2. The only way we can square a number to get a multiple of 2 is if that number is a multiple of 2. If you square 3, you get 9. But if you square 8, you get 64, right? It has to be a multiple of 2 for its square to be a multiple of 2. And so 2 must go in to b. And that's our contradiction. Remember, big deal. We assumed that a and b have no common factors, but we've just shown that b has 2 as a factor, right? b is a multiple of 2. But also, a has 2 as a factor. a is a multiple of 2. A and B both have a factor of 2, so in fact they do have common factors, and thus we've reached a contradiction. Assuming that root 2 is rational means we can write it as a fraction like this, and if we can write it as a fraction, we could certainly write it as a fraction in lowest terms. But assuming that, we reach this contradiction where we see that in fact we haven't written it in lowest terms. And we could infinitely repeat this process and, and infinitely reduce the fraction, which is not possible, right? So um, we're certainly allowed to assume it's fully reduced if we can write it as a fraction. But when we make that assumption, we eventually see that, in fact, it's not fully reduced. That's a contradiction. And so the assumption that we made that led to this contradiction has to be false. It must not be that the square root of 2 is rational. Instead, it must be the case that the square root of 2 is irrational. All right, now as promised, up here in the top of the paper, we'll try to do this proof again, but let's try to prove that the square root of 4 
is irrational and see where this proof breaks down. There's uh, an, an important result related to this proof that I, I didn't mention by name. Um, perhaps you, you know what it is, you know it's coming, but uh, let's see, let's get into the details. So the square root of four, what's the square root of four? I gotta move my microphone here. What's the square root of four? Well, we all know it's two, right? It's rational, of course, it's rational. It's equal to two um, and two is a rational number. So if we try to prove that the square root of four is irrational, the proof should fall apart. But, you know, where is this argument going to fall apart for the square root of four? It's perhaps not clear. Let's try. Let's see. Let's see. Um, so let's just suppose that uh, the square root of four is rational, and then we can write it as a fraction in lowest terms. So then the square root of four must be equal to a over b. As before, a and b are integers, and b is not equal to zero. And then we can square both sides. So on the left, I have four. And on the right, I have a squared divided by b squared. Multiply both sides by b squared, and we get that 4b squared is equal to a squared. All right, and now we can start to apply some of the reasoning we did before with the uh, multiple stuff. So here I see that a squared is a multiple of 4, because 4 multiplied by something is equal to a squared. So a squared is a multiple of 4. We can write that 4 divides a squared. And then if 4 divides a squared, of course, 4 must... Oh, wait. It mustn't. It, it is not necessary, right? The logic we used over here is not necessary over here. It does not follow. It does not follow that 4 divides a. Not true. If 4 divides a squared, there's many ways that could happen, right? For example, 4 divides 2 squared. Of course, two is actually what a has to equal in this case, since we know the square root of four is two over one. So in fact, a does equal two, but this is a good example. Four does divide two squared. Two squared is a multiple of four because two squared is four. But does four divide two? Is two a multiple of four? No, it's certainly not, right? And so you see why the logic breaks down. Another example um, could be four divides six squared, right? Six squared is 36, four goes into that nine times. So six squared is a multiple of four. But is six a multiple of four? No, it's not, right? So six has a factor of two in it. So when you square it, you actually end up getting a multiple of four, but the six all by itself, it is not a multiple of four because it only has one factor of two. Four, of course, has two factors of two. So this is where the logic breaks down. Now, the logic we used here with root two, we were thinking about even numbers. Um, you could say I slightly glossed over the details, trying to just keep this fairly kind of introductory and accessible. Um, you know, you just think, oh, even number squared is even, odd number squared is odd, so that works out okay. Uh, but this proof actually works good for other prime numbers too, like three. We could use it to prove the square root of three is irrational. But then it comes down to the fact that three is prime. And when we arrive at, you know, let, let's say we were applying this proof to the square root of three, and we get to three divides a squared, because three is prime, we can assume that three divides a. Uh, that's called Euclid's lemma. If a prime number divides a product of two numbers, which in this case it does, right? If three divides a squared, that means that three divides a times a. So th uh, the prime number three is dividing this product. The only way that's possible for a prime number is if three divides at least one of those numbers in the product. For three to divide a times a means that three has to divide a, right? Because it has to divide at least one of these and of course they're both a, so we just get that three divides a. So while it might have seemed the logic here was special for two and we see how it breaks down for a number like four, it's actually logic that works for prime numbers and that's uh, that's the crux here. We could use it to prove that the square root of any prime number um, is irrational with that slight adjustment. So it's a great question. I think you can learn a lot by trying to apply a proof to a situation where you know it should fail. Uh, it definitely makes you a little more aware of some of the details that could be easier to gloss over when the whole thing goes smoothly because you know, you're applying it to a situation where it actually works out. Uh, but uh, anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and uh, be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.